Introduction of the Little Tea Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This has been read by Roslyn Carlyle. The Little Tea Book by Arthur Gray. Introduction. Colley Sibber once said this about tea. Thou soft, thou sober, sage and venerable liquid, thou innocent pretence for bringing the wicked of both sexes together in the morning, thou female tongue-running, smile-soothing, heart-opening, wink-tipping cordial, to whose glorious insipidity I owe the happiest moments of my life. Introducing the Little Tea Book After all, tea is the drink. Domestically and socially, it is the beverage of the world. There may be those who will come forward with their figures to prove that other fruits of the soil, agriculturally and commercially, are more important. Perhaps they are right when quoting statistics. But what other product can compare with tea in the high regard in which it has always been held by writers whose standing in literature and recognized good taste in other walks cannot be questioned a glance through this book will show that the spirit of the tea beverage is one of peace comfort and refinement as these qualities are all associated with the ways of women it is to them therefore the real rulers of the world that tea owes its prestige and vogue further peeps through these pages prove this to be true for nearly all the allusions and references to the beverage by male writers reveal the womanly influence that tea imparts but this is not all the side lights of history customs manners and modes of living which tea plays in the life of all nations will be found entertaining and instructive linked with the fine feminine atmosphere which pervades the drinking of the beverage everywhere a leaf which can combine so much deserves at least a little human hearing for its long list of virtues, for its peaceful walks, talks, tales, tattle, thrills and fancies, which go to make up this tribute to the cup that cheers, but not inebriates. End of Introduction Chapter 1 of The Little Tea Book this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Meilinger. The Little Tea Book by Arthur Gray. The Origin of Tea. Dharma, third son of Koyuvo, king of India, a religious high priest from Shiaka, the author of that eastern paganism about a thousand years before the christian era coming to china to teach the way of happiness lived a most austere life passing his days in continual mortification and retiring by night to solitudes in which he fed only upon the leaves of trees and other vegetable productions after several years passed in this manner in fasting and watching it happened that contrary to his vows the pious dharma fell asleep when he awoke he was so much enraged at himself that to prevent the offence to his vows for the future he got rid of his eyelids and placed them on the ground on the following day returning to his accustomed devotions he beheld with amazement springing up from his eyelids two small shrubs of an unusual appearance such as he had never before seen and of whose qualities he was of course entirely ignorant the saint however not being wholly devoid of curiosity or perhaps being unusually hungry was prompted to eat of the leaves and immediately felt within him a wonderful elevation of mind and the vehement desire of divine contemplation with which he acquainted his disciples who were eager to follow the example of their instructor and they readily received into common use the fragrant plant which has been the theme of so many poetical and literary pens in succeeding ages. End of chapter 1
Chapter Two of the Little Tea Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This has been read by Rosalind Carlyle. The Little Tea Book by Arthur Gray. Chapter Two. Tea by Francis Soltus Soltus. From what enchanted Eden came thy leaves that hide such subtle spirits of perfume? Did eyes Priadamite first see the bloom, luscious nepenthe of the soul it grieves? By thee the tired and torpid mind conceives, fairer than roses brightening life's gloom. Thy protean charm can every form assume, and turn December nights to April eves. Thy amber-tinted drops bring back to me Fantastic shapes of great Mongolian towers, Emblazoned banners and the booming gong. I hear the sound of feast and revelry and smell, Far sweeter than the sweetest flowers, The kiosks of Pekin, fragrant of Oolong. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of the Little Tea Book》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in August 2014.《The Little Tea Book》by Arthur Gray. Little cups of Chinese and Japanese tea. Although the legend credits the pious East Indian with the discovery of tea, there is no evidence extant that India is really the birthplace of the plant. Since India has no record of date or facts on stone or tablet, or ever handed down a single incident of song or story, apart from the legend, as to the origin of tea, one is loath to accept the claim, if claim they assert, of a people who are not above practising the black art at every turn of their fancy. Certain it is that China, first in many things, knew tea as soon as any nation of the world. The early Chinese were not only more progressive than other peoples, but linked with their progress were important researches and invaluable discoveries which the civilised world has long ago recognised. Then, why not add tea to the list? At any rate, it is easy to believe that the Chinese were first in the tea fields, and that undoubtedly the plant was a native of both China and Japan when it was slumbering on the slopes of India, unpicked, unsteeped, undrunk, unhonored, and unsung. A celebrated Buddhist, Saint Dengyo Daishai, is credited with having introduced tea into Japan from China as early as the 4th century. It is likely that he was the first to teach the Japanese the use of the herb, for it had long been a favorite beverage in the mountains of the Celestial Kingdom. The plant, however, is found in so many parts of Japan that there can be little doubt but that it is indigenous there as well. The word tea is of Chinese origin, being derived from the Amoy and Swoto reading tei of the same character, which expresses both the ancient name of tea Tsu, and the more modern one, cha, Japanese tea, chiya, pronounced cha. Tea was not known in China before the Tang dynasty, 618 to 906 AD. An infusion of some kind of leaf, however, was used as early as the Chao dynasty, 1122 to 255 BC, as we learn from the Urya a glossary of terms used in ancient history and poetry. This work, which is classified by subjects, has been assigned as the beginning of the Chao dynasty, but belongs more properly to the era of Confucius, Kang Kai, 551-479 BC. Although known in Japan for more than a thousand years, tea only gradually became the national beverage as late as the 14th century. 
in the first half of the eighth century seven hundred twenty nine a d there was a record made of a religious festival at which the forty fifth mikado sublime gate shomme tenno entertained the buddhist priests with tea a hitherto unknown beverage from korea which country was for many years the high road of chinese culture to japan after the ninth century eight hundred twenty three a d and for four centuries thereafter tea fell into disuse and almost oblivion among the japanese the nobility and buddhist priests however continued to drink it as a luxury during the reign of the eighty-third emperor eleven ninety nine to twelve ten a d the cultivation of tea was permanently established in japan in 1200, the bonze Yese brought tea seeds from China, which he planted on the mountains in one of the most northern provinces. Yese is also credited with introducing the Chinese custom of ceremonious tea drinking. At any rate, he presented tea seeds to Meiki, the abbot of the monastery of Togano, to whom the use of tea had been recommended for its stimulating properties and instructed him in the mystery of its cultivation treatment and preparation meiki who laid out plantations near uzi was successful as a pupil and even now the tea growers of that neighbourhood pay tribute to his memory by annually offering at his shrine the first gathered tea leaves after that period the use of tea became more and more in fashion the monks and their kindred having discovered its property of keeping them awake during long vigils and nocturnal prayers from this time on the development and progress of the plant are interwoven with the histories and customs of these countries End of chapter three chapter four of the little tea book this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Little Tea Book by Arthur Gray On Tea The following short poem by Edmund Waller is believed to be the first one written in praise of The Cup That Does Not Inebriate. Venus, her myrtle, Phoebus has her bays. Tea both excels, which she vouchsafes to praise. The best of queens and best of herbs we owe to that bold nation, which the way did show to the fair region where the sun doth rise, whose rich productions we so justly prize. The muse's friend, tea does our fancy aid, repress those vapors which the head invade and keep the palace of the soul serene tit on her birthday to salute the queen waller was born in sixteen o five and died in sixteen eighty seven aged eighty two end of chapter four recording by todd chapter five of the little tea book this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Little Tea Book by Arthur Gray Some English Tea History Tea was brought into Europe by the Dutch East India Company in 1610. It was at least forty, and perhaps forty-seven, years later that England woke up to the fascinations of the new drink. Dr. Johnson puts it at even a later date, for he claims that tea was first introduced into England by Lords Arlington and Ossory in 1666, and really made its debut into society when the wives of these noblemen gave it its vogue. If Dr. Johnson's statement is intended to mean that nothing is anything until the red seal of the select says, Thus shall it be, he is right in the year he has selected. If, on the other hand, the doctor had in mind society at large, he is mixed in his dates, or leaves, for tea was drawn and drunk in London nine years before that date. Garway, the founder of Garraway's Coffee House, 
claimed the honor of being the first to offer tea in leaf and drink for public sale in 1657. It is pretty safe to fix the entrance of tea into Europe even a few years ahead of his announcement, for merchants in those days did not advertise their wares in advance. However, this date is about the beginning of tea time, for in the Mercurius Politicus of September 1658 appeared the following advertisement. That excellent, and by all physicians approved, China drink, called by the Chinians cha, by other nations te, or tea, is sold at the Sultana's Head, a coffee house, in Sweeting's Rents, by the Royal Exchange, London. Like all new things when they have fastened on to the public's favor, tea was on everyone's lips and in everyone's mouth. It was lauded to the skies, and was supposed to be good for all the ills of the flesh. It would cure colds and consumption, clear the sight, remove lassitude, purify the liver, improve digestion, create appetite, strengthen the memory, and cure fever and ague. One panegyrist says, while never putting the patient in mind of his disease, it cheers the heart without disordering the head, strengthens the feet of the old, and settles the heads of the young, cools the brain of the hard drinker, and warms that of the sober student, relieves the sick, and makes the healthy better. Epicures drink it for want of an appetite, bon vivants to remove the effects of a suffet of wine, gluttons as a remedy for indigestion, politicians for the vertigo, doctors for drowsiness, prudes for the vapors, wits for the spleen, and beaux to improve their complexions. Summing up, by declaring tea to be a treat for the frugal, a regali for the luxurious, a successful agent for the man of business, and a bracer for the idle. Poets and verse-makers join the chorus in praise of tea, in Greek and Latin. One poet pictures Hebe pouring the delightful cup for the goddesses, who, finding it made their beauty brighter and their wit more brilliant, drank so deeply as to disgust Jupiter, who had forgotten that he, himself, drank tea that happy morn when wise Minerva of his brain was born. Laureant Tate, who wrote a poem on tea in two cantos, described a family jar among the fair deities, because each desired to become the special patroness of the ethereal drink destined to triumph over wine. Another versifier exalts it at the expense of its would-be rival, coffee. In vain would coffee boast an equal good, the crystal stream transcends the flowing mud. Tea, even the ills from coffee spring repairs, disclaims its vices, and its virtues shares. Another despairing enthusiast exclaims, Hail, goddess of the vegetable, hail, to sing thy worth, all words, all numbers fail. The new beverage did not have the field all to itself, however, for, while it was generally admitted that, tea was fixed, and come to stay, it could not drive good meat and drink away. Lovers of the old and conservative customs of the table were not anxious to try the novelty. Others shied at it. Some flirted with it, in tiny teaspoons. Others openly deified and attacked it. Among the latter were a number of robust versifiers and physicians. T'was better for each British virgin, when on roast beef, strong beer, and sturgeon, joyous to breakfast they sat round, nor were ashamed to eat a pound. The fleshy school of doctors were only too happy to disagree with their brethren respecting the merits and demerits of the newfangled drink, and it is hard to say which were more bitter, the friends or the foes of tea. Maria Theresa's physician, Count Belchigen, attributed the discovery of a number of new diseases to the debility born of daily tea drinking. Dr. Polly denied that it had either taste or fragrance, owing its reputation entirely to the peculiar vessels and water used by the Chinese, so that it was folly to partake of it, unless tea drinkers could supply themselves with pure water from the Vasi and the fragrant teapots of Jining. This sagacious sophist and dogmatizer also discovered that, among the other evils, tea drinking deprived its devotees of the power of expectoration, and entailed sterility. Therefore he hoped Europeans would therefore keep to their natural beverages, wine and ale, and reject coffee, chocolate, and tea, which were all equally bad for them. In spite of the array of old-fashioned doctors, wits, and lovers of the pipe and bottle, who opposed evil effects, sneered at the finely bred men of England being turned into women, and grumbled at the stingy custom of calling for dishwater after dinner, the custom of tea-drinking continued to grow. 
In 1689 the sale of the leaf had increased sufficiently to make it politic to reduce the duty on it from eight pence on the decretation to five shillings a pound on the leaf. The value of tea at this time may be estimated from a customs house report of the sale of a quantity of diverse sorts and qualities, the worst being equal to that used in coffee houses for making a single tea, which, being disposed of by inch of candle, fetched an average of twelve shillings a pound. During the next three years, the consumption of tea was greatly increased, but very little seems to have been known about it by those who drank it, if we may judge from the enlightenment received from a pamphlet given gratis up one flight of stairs at the sign of the anodyne necklace without Temple Bar. All it tells us about tea is that it is a leaf of a little shoot growing plentifully in the East Indies, that Bohia, called by the French bean tea, is best of a morning with bread and butter, being of a more nourishing nature than the green which may be used when a meal is not wanted. Three or four cups at a sitting are enough, and the little milk or cream renders the beverage smoother and more powerful in blunting the acid humours of the stomach. The satirist believed that tea had a contrary effect upon the acid humours of the mind, making the tea-table the arena for the display of the feminine capacity for backbiting and scandal. Listen to Swift describe a lady enjoying her evening cups of tea. Surrounded with the noisy clans of prudes, coquettes, and harridans, now voices over voices rise, while each to be the loudest vies. They contradict, affirm, dispute, no single tongue, one moment mute, all mad to speak, and none to hearken. They set the very lapdog barkin. Their chattering makes a louder din than fishwise o'er a cup of gin, far less the rabble roar and rail when drunk with sour election ale. Even gentle Gay associated soft tea with the temper of women when he pictures Doris and Melanthe abusing all their bosom friends, while, through all the room from flowery tea, exhales a fragrant fume. But not all the women were tea drinkers in those days. There was Madame Drake, the proprietress of one of the three private carriages Manchester could boast. Few men were as courageous as she in declaring against the tea table when they were but invited guests. Madame Drake did not hesitate to make it known when she paid an afternoon's visit that she expected to be offered her customary solace, a tankard of ale and a pipe of tobacco. Another female opponent of tea was the female spectator, which declared the use of the fluid to be not only expensive, but pernicious, the utter destruction of all economy, the bane of good housewifery, and the source of all idleness. Tradesmen especially suffered from the habit they could not serve their customers, because their apprentices were absent during the busiest hours of the day, drumming up gossips for their mistress's tea-tables. This same censor says that the most temperate find themselves obliged to drink wine freely after tea, or supplement their bohea with rum and brandy, the bottle and glass becoming as necessary to the tea-table as the slop-basin. Although Joseph Hanway, the father of the umbrella, was successful in keeping off water, he was not successful in keeping out tea. All he did accomplish in his essay on the subject was to call forth a reply from Dr. Johnson, who, strange to say, instead of vigorously defending his favorite tipple, rather excuses it as an amiable weakness, confessing that tea is a barren superfluity, fit only to amuse the idle, relax the studious, and dilute the meals of those who cannot take exercise and will not practice abstinence. His chief argument in tea's favor is that it is drunk in no great quantity even by those who use it most, and, as it neither exhilarates the heart nor stimulates the palate, is, after all, but a nominal entertainment, serving as a pretense for assembling people together, for interrupting business, diversifying idleness, admitting that, perhaps, while gratifying the taste without nourishing the body, it is quite unsuited to the lower classes. It is a singular fact, too, that at that period there was no other equally vigorous defender of the beverage. All the best of the other writers did was to praise its pleasing qualities, associations, and social attributes. Still, tea grew in popular favor, privately and publicly. The custom had now become so general that every wife looked upon the teapot, cups, and caddy to be as much her right by marriage as the wedding ring itself. Fine ladies enjoyed the crowded public entertainments with tea below stairs and ventilators above. Citizens fortunate enough to have leaden roofs to their houses took their tea and their ease thereon. On Sundays, finding the country lanes leading to Kensington, Hampstead, Highgate, Islington, and Stepney to be much pleasanter than the paths of the gospel, 
the people flocked to those suburban resorts with their wives and children to take tea under the trees. In one of Coleman's plays, a Spitalfields dame defines the acme of elegance as drinking tea on summer afternoons at Bagnigge Wells with china and gilt spoons. London was surrounded with tea gardens, the most popular being Sadlier's Wells, Merlin's Cave, Cromwell Gardens, Jenny's Whim, Copper Gardens, London Spa, and the White Conduit House, where they used to take in fifty pounds on a Sunday afternoon for six penny tea tickets. One Darchandholz was surprised by the elegance, beauty, and luxury of these resorts, where, Steele said, they swallowed gallons of the juice of tea, while their own dock leaves were trodden underfoot. The ending of the East India Company's monopoly of the trade, coupled with the fact that the legislature recognized that tea had passed out of the catalogue of luxuries into that of necessities, began a new era for the Queen of Drinks destined to reign over all other beverages. End of chapter 5. Recording by Todd. Chapter 6 of The Little Tea Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Little Tea Book by Arthur Gray. O.T. In the drama of the past, thou art featured in the cast. O.T. And thou hast played thy part with never a change of heart. O oh, T, for mid all the ding and dong waits a welcome soothing song for fragrant hyson and oolong. A song of peace through all the years, of fireside fancies devoid of fears, of mother's talks and mother's lays, of grandmother's comforts, quiet ways, of gossip perhaps, still and yet, what of Johnson? Would we forget the pictured cup? Those merry times, when round the board with ready rhymes, Walder, Dryden, and Addison, young, Grave Pope de Gay, when Cowper's sung, Sidney Smith, too, gentle lamb brew, Tennyson, Dickens, Dr. Holmes knew, The cup that cheered, those sober souls, And tiny tea-trays, samovars, and bowls. So here's a toast to the queen of plants, The queen of plants, Bohea. Good wife, ring for your maiden aunts, We'll all have cups of tea. Arthur Gray. End of chapter six. Recording by Todd. Section seven of The Little Tea Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in august two thousand fourteen the little tea book by arthur gray tea terms japanese orimono cha folded tea gyokuro cha dewdrop tea uzu cha light tea koi cha dark tea tobidashi cha Sifted tea, bancha, common tea, yushutsu cha, export tea, neri cha, brick tea, koku cha, black tea, ko cha, tea dust broken leaves, ryoku cha, green tea, Chinese. Bo hair, happy establishment, so called after two ranges of hills, Fu Qian or Fo Qian. Gongo, labor, named so at Amoy from the labor in preparing it. Zo Chong, small kind. He Son, flourishing spring. Pe Ke, white hair. So called because only the youngest leaves are gathered, which still have the delicate down, white hair, on the surface. Po Chong, folded tea, so called at Canton after the manner of picking it. Brick tea, 
prepared in central china from the commonest sorts of tea by soaking the tea refuse such as broken leaves twigs and dust in boiling water and then pressing them into moulds used in siberia and mongolia where it also serves as a medium of exchange the mongols placed the bricks when testing the quality on the head and try to pull downward over the eyes they reject the brick as worthless if it breaks or bends end of section seven chapter eight of the little tea book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano The Little Tea Book by Arthur Gray Chapter 8 Tea Leaves by John Ernest McCann According to Henry Thomas Buckle, the author of The History of Civilization in England, who was the master of eighteen languages, and had a library of twenty-two thousand volumes with an income of seventy-five thousand a year at the age of twenty-nine in eighteen fifty he died in eighteen sixty at the age of thirty-nine tea-making and drinking were or are what wendell phillips would call lost arts he thought that when it came to brewing tea the Chinese philosophers were not living in his vicinity. He distinctly wrote that, until he showed her how, no woman of his acquaintance could make a decent cup of tea. He insisted upon a warm cup, and even spoon and saucer. Not that Mr. Buckle ever sipped tea from a saucer. Of course, he was right in insisting upon those above-mentioned things, for tea things, like a tea party, should be in sympathy with the tea, not antagonistic to it. Still, not always, for, on one memorable occasion, in the little town of Boston, the greatest tea party in history was anything but sympathetic. But let that pass. Emperor Qinlung wrote, two hundred years or more ago, for the benefit of his children, just before he left the flowery kingdom for a flowerier set a teapot over a slow fire fill it with cold water boil it long enough to turn a lobster red pour it on the quantity of tea in a porcelain vessel allow it to remain on the leaves until the vapor evaporates then sip it slowly and all your sorrows will follow the vapor he says nothing about milk or sugar but to me tea without sugar is poison as it is with milk I can drink one cup of tea, or coffee, with sugar, but without milk, and feel no ill effects. But if I put milk in either tea or coffee, I am as sick as a defeated candidate for the presidency. That little bit of fact is written as a hint to many who are ill without knowing why they are, after drinking tea or coffee with milk in it. I don't think that milk was ever intended for coffee or tea. Why should it be? who was the first to color tea and coffee with milk. It may have been a mad prince, in the presence of his flatterers and imitators, to be odd, or just to see if his flatterers would adopt the act. The Russians sometimes put champagne in their tea, the Germans beer, the Irish whiskey, the New Yorker ice cream, the English oysters or clams, if in season, the true Bostonian rose leaves, in the italian and spaniard onions and garlic you all know one of the following lines imperfectly scarcely one in one hundred quotes them correctly i never have quoted them as written off-hand but lines run out of my head like schoolboys out of school when the lessons and tasks are all ended and school for the day is dismissed here are the lines now stir the fire and close the shutters fast let fall the curtains, wheel the sofa round, and while the bubbling and loud hissing urn 
throws up a steamly column, and the cups that cheer, but not inebriate, wait on each, to let us welcome peaceful evening in. Isn't that a picture? Not one superfluous word in it. Who knows its author, or when it was written, or can quote the line before or after? The cups that cheer, but not inebriate. Or in what poem the lines run down the ages? I tell you, not I. I don't believe in encouraging laziness. If I tell you, you will let it slip from your memory, like a panic-stricken eel through the fingers of a panic-stricken schoolboy. But if you hunt it up, it will be riveted to your memory, like a ballet, and one never forgets when, where, how, why, and from whom he receives that. What a pity that, in Shakespeare's time, there was no tea-table. What a delightful comedy he could, and would, have written around it, placing the scene in his native Stratford. What a charming hostess at a tea-table his mother, Mary Arden, loveliest of womanly names, would have made. Any of the ladies of the delightful Cranford wouldn't be a circumstance to a tea-table scene in a Warwickshire comedy, with lovely Mary Arden Shakespeare as the protagonist if the comedy were from the pen of her delightful boy, Will. Had T been known in Shakespeare's time, how much more closely he would have brought his sexes under one roof, instead of sending the more animal of the two off to the boar's head and the mermaid, leaving the ladies to their own verbal devices. Shakespeare, being such a delicate, as well as virile poet, would have taken to tea as naturally as a bee takes to a rose or honeysuckle, for the very word tea suggests all that is fragrant and clean and spotless. Linen, silver, china, toast, butter, a charming room with charming women, charmingly gowned, and peach and plum and apple trees, with the scent of roses, just beyond the open, half-curtained windows, looking down upon, or over, orchard or garden, as the May or June morning breezes suggest eternal youth as they filled the room with perfume, tenderness, love, optimism, and hope in immortality. Coffee suggests taverns, cafes, sailing vessels, yachts, boarding houses by the riverside, and pessimism. Tea suggests optimism. Coffee is a tonic. Tea a comfort. Coffee is prose. Tea is poetry. Whoever thinks of taking coffee into a sick room, who doesn't think of taking in the comforting cup of tea? Could the most vivid imagination picture the angels, above the stars, drinking coffee? No. Yet, if I were to show them to you over the teacups, you would not be surprised or shocked, would you? Not a bit of it, you would say. That's a very pretty picture. Pray, what are they talking about? Or of whom are they talking? Why, of their loved ones below, and of the days of their coming above the stars? They know when to look for us, and while the time may seem long to us, before the celestial reunion, to them it is short. They do not worry, as we do. We could not match their beautiful serenity if we tried, for they know the folly of wishing to break or change divine laws. What delightful scandals have been born at tea-tables! rose and lavender, and old point-lace scandals, surely no brutal scandals or treasons, as in the taverns. Tea-table gossip surely never seriously hurt a reputation. Well, name one. No? Well, think of the shattered reputations that have fallen around the bottle. Men are the worst gossips unhanged, not women. In 1652, tea sold for as high as ten pounds in the leaf. Peps had his first cup of tea in September 1660. See his diary. The rare recipe for making tea in those days was known only to the elect, and here it is. To a pint of tea, add the yolks of two fresh eggs, and beat them up with as much fine sugar as is sufficient to sweeten the tea, and stir well together. The water must remain no longer upon the tea than while you can chant the Miserere Psalm in a leisurely fashion but I am not endorsing recipes of two hundred and fifty odd years ago. 
The above is from the knowledge box of a Chinese priest, or a priest from China, called Pierre Couplet. Don't print it quatrain in 1667. He gave it to the Earl of Clarendon, and I extend it to you if you wish to try it. John Milton knew the delights of tea. He drank coffee during the composition of Paradise Lost, and tea during the building of Paradise Regained. Like all good things, animate and inanimate, tea did not become popular without a struggle. It, like the gradual oak, met with many kinds of opposition, from the timid, the prejudiced, and the selfish. All sorts of herbs were put upon the market to offset its popularity, such as onions, sage, marjoram, the arctic bramble, the slow, goat-weed, Mexican goosefoot, speedwell, wild geranium, veronica, wormwood, juniper, saffron, cardus, benedictus, trefoil, wood sorrel, pepper, mace, scurry grass, plantain, and betony. Sir Hans Sloane invented herb tea, and Captain Cook's companion, Dr. Solander, invented another tea. But it was no use. Tea had come to stay, and a blessing it has been to the world, when moderately used. You don't want to become a tea drunkard like Dr. Johnson, nor a coffee fiend like Balzac. Be moderate in all things, and you are bound to be happy and live long. Moderation in eating, drinking, loving, hating, smoking, talking, acting, fighting, sleeping, walking, lending, borrowing, reading newspapers, and expressing opinions, even in bathing and praying, means long life and happiness. End of chapter 8 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 9 of The Little Tea Book This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano The Little Tea Book by Arthur Gray Chapter 9 Wit, Wisdom, and Humor of Tea Tea tempers the spirits and harmonizes the mind, dispels lassitude and relieves fatigue, awakens thought and prevents drowsiness, lightens or refreshes the body, and clears the perceptive faculties. Confucius Thank God for tea. What would the world do without tea? How did it exist? I am glad I was not born before tea. Sidney Smith Sammy, whispered Mr. Weller, if some o' these here people don't want to happen tomorrow morning, I ain't your father, and that's what it is. Why, this here old lady next to me is a drowning herself in tea. Be quiet, can't you? murmured Sam. Sam, whispered Mr. Weller, a moment afterward, in a tone of deep agitation. Mark my words, my boy. If that ere secretary feller keeps on for five minutes more, he'll blow himself up with toast and water. Well, let him if he likes, replied Sam. It ain't no business of yourn. If this here lasts much longer, Sammy, said Mr. Weller, in the same low voice. I shall feel it my duty as a human being to rise and address the cheer. There's a young woman on the next farm but two, as has drank nine breakfast cups and a half, and she's a swellin visibly before me weary eyes. Pickwick Papers Books upon books have been published in relation to the evil effects of tea drinking. But, for all that, no statistics are at hand to show that their arguments have made teetotalers of tea drinkers. One of the best things, however, said against tea drinking, is distinctly in its favor to a certain extent. It is from one Dr. Pauly, who laments that, 
Tea so dries the bodies of the Chinese that they can hardly spit. This will find few sympathizers among us. We suggest the quotation to some enterprising tea dealer to be used in a street car advertisement. Of all methods of making tea, that hit upon Heine's Italian landlord was perhaps the most economical. Heine lodged in a house at Lucca, the first floor of which was occupied by an English family. The latter complained of the cookery of Italy in general, and their landlords in particular. Heine declared the landlord brewed the best tea he had ever tasted in the country, and to convince his doubtful English friends, invited them to take tea with him and his brother. The invitation was accepted. Tea time came, but no tea. When the poet's patience was exhausted, his brother went to the kitchen to expedite matters. There he found his landlord, who, in blissful ignorance of what company the Heinies had invited, cried, You can get no tea, for the family on the first floor have not taken tea this evening. The tea that had delighted Heine was made from the used leaves of the English party, who found and made their own tea, and thus afforded the landlord an opportunity of obtaining at once praise and profit by this Italian method of serving a pot of tea. Chambers Journal Fate Matrons who toss the cup and see The grounds of fate in grounds of tea. Churchill End of chapter 9 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 10 of The Little Tea Book This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Abai in August 2014. The Little Tea Book by Arthur Gray Tea Making and Taking in Japan and China The Queen of Teas in Japan is a fine straw-colored beverage, delicate and subtle in flavor, and as invigorating as a glass of champagne. It is real Japan tea, and seldom leaves its native heath for the reason that while it is peculiarly adaptable to the Japanese constitution, it is too stimulating for the finely tuned and oversensitive Americans, who, by the way, are said to be the largest customers for Japan teas of other grades in the world. This particular tea, which looks as harmless as our own importations of the leaf, is a very insidious beverage, as an American lady soon found out after taking some of it late at night. She declared, after drinking a small cup before retiring, she did not close her eyes in sleep for a week. We do not know the name of the brand of tea, and are glad of it, for we live in a section where the women are especially curious. But the drink of the people at large in Japan is green tea, although powdered tea is also used, but reserved for special functions and ceremonial occasions. Tea over there is not made by infusing the leaves with boiling water, as is the case with us, but the boiling water is first carefully cooled in another vessel to 176 degrees Fahrenheit. The leaves are also renewed for every infusion. It would be crime against his august majesty, the palate, to use the same leaves more than once. In Japan. The preparation of good tea is regarded by the Japs as the height of social art, and for that reason it is an important element in the domestic, diplomatic, political, and general life of the country. Tea is the beverage, the masterpiece of every meal, even if it be nothing but boiled rice. Every artisan and laborer going to work carries with him his rice box of lacquered wood, a kettle, a tea caddy, a teapot, a cup, and his chopsticks. Milk and sugar are generally askewed. The Japs and the Chinese never indulge in either of these ingredients in tea, the use of which, they claim, spoils the delicate aroma. 
from the highest court circles down to the lowliest and poorest of the emperor's subjects it is the custom in both japan and china to offer tea to every visitor upon his arrival not to do this would be an unpardonable breach of national manners even in the shops the customer is regaled with a soothing cup before the goods are displayed to him this does not however impose any obligation on the prospective purchaser but it is nevertheless a good stimulant to part with his money this appears to be a very ancient tradition in china and japan so ancient that it is continued by the powers that be in paradise and hades according to a translation called strange stories from my small library a classical chinese work published in sixteen seventy nine the old domestic etiquette of japan never entrusted to a servant the making of tea for a guest it was made by the master of the house himself the custom probably growing out of the innate politeness and courtesy of a people who believe that an honored visitor is entitled to the best entertainment possible to give him as soon as a guest is seated upon his mat a small tray is set before the master of the house upon this tray is a tiny teapot with a handle at right angles to the spout other parts of this outfit include a highly artistic tea kettle filled with hot water and a requisite number of small cups set in metal or bamboo trays these trays are used for handling the cups around but the guest is not expected to take one the cups being without handles and not easy to hold the visitor must therefore be careful lest he let one slip through his untutored fingers the teapot is drenched with hot water before the tea is put in then more hot water is poured over the leaves and soon poured off into the cups this is repeated several times but the hot water is never allowed to stand on the grounds over a minute the japanese all adhere to the general household custom of the country in keeping the necessary tea apparatus in readiness in the living room of every house is contained a brazier with live coals a kettle to boil water a tray with teapot cups and a tea caddy their neighbors the chinese are just as alert for no matter what hour of the day it may be they always keep a kettle of boiling water over the hot coals ready to make and serve the beverage at a moment's notice no visitor is allowed to leave without being offered a cup of their tea and they themselves are glad to share in their own hospitality the chinese use boiling water and pour it upon the dry tea in each cup among the better social element is used a cup shaped like a small bowl with a saucer a little less in diameter than the top of the bowl this saucer also serves another purpose and is often used for a cover when the tea is making after the boiling water is poured upon the tea it is covered for a couple of minutes until the leaves have separated and fallen to the bottom of the cup this process renders the tea clear delightfully fragrant and appetizing a variety of other cups are also used the most prominent being without handles one or two sizes larger than the japanese they are made of the finest china set in silver trays beautifully wrought ornate in treatment and design a complete tea outfit is a part of the outfitting of every ju bako picnic box with which every jap is provided when on a journey making an excursion or attending a picnic the japanese are very much given to these out-of-door affairs which they call hanami looking at the flowers no wonder they are fond of these pleasures for it is a land of lovely landscapes and heaven-sent airs completely in harmony with the poetic and artistic natures of this splendid people tea houses chaya which take the place of our cafes and bar rooms but which nevertheless serve a far higher social purpose are everywhere in evidence on the high roads and by roads tucked away in templed groves and public resorts of every nature 
Among the Japanese are a number of ceremonial, social, and literary tea parties, which reflect their courtly and chivalrous spirit, and keep alive the traditions of the people more, perhaps, than any other of their functions. The most important of these tea parties are exclusively for gentlemen, and their forms and ceremonies rank among the most refined usages of polite society. The customs of these gatherings are so peculiarly characteristic of the Japanese that few foreign observers have an opportunity of attending them. These are the tea parties of a semi-literary or aesthetic character, and the ceremonious cha no ya. In the first prevails the easy and unaffected tone of the well-bred gentleman. In the other are observed the strictest rules of etiquette both in speech and behavior. But the former entertainment is by far the most interesting. The Japanese love and taste for fine scenery is shown in the settings and surroundings. To this picturesque outlook, recitals of romance and impromptu poetry add intellectual charm to the tea party. For these occasions, the host selects a tea house located in well-laid-out grounds and commanding a fine view. In this, he lays mats equal to the number of guests. By sliding the partition and removing the front wall, the place is transformed into an open hall overlooking the landscape. The room is filled with choice flowers and the art treasures of the host, which at other times are stored away in the fireproof vault, go down, of his private residence, contribute artistic beauty and decoration to the scene. Folding screens and hanging pictures painted by celebrated artists, costly lacquerware, bronze, china, and other heirlooms are tastefully distributed about the room. Stories told at these tea parties are called by the Japanese names of cha banashi, meaning tea stories, or hitikucha, one-mouth stories, short stories told at one sitting. At times, professional storytellers are employed. Of these, there are two kinds, storytellers and cross-road tradition narrators, both of whom, since olden times, have been the faithful custodians and disseminators of native folklore and tales. These professionals are divided into a number of classes, the most important being the Hanashika, members of a celebrated company under a well-known manager, who unites them into troops of never less than five, or more than seven, in number. Such companies are often advertised weeks before their arrival in a place by hoisting flags or streamers with the names of the performers thereon. Their program consists of war stories, traditions, and recitals with musical accompaniment. During the intermission, feats of ledger domain or wrestling fill in the time and give variety to the entertainment. These are the leading professional performers. The other classes, while not held in as high regard by the select, nevertheless have a definite place in Japanese amusement circles. One of the latter is the Tsuji Ko Shakuji. This word swallower does not belong to any company but is a freelance entertainer. A sort of has-been, he does not, however, rest on his past laurels, but continues to perform wherever he contain an audience, on the highways, to passers-by, in public resorts and thoroughfares. Although the Chinese are not so neat in their public habits as the Japs, still their tea-houses and similar resorts are just as numerous and popular as they are in the neighboring country. Perhaps the most interesting caterers in China, however, are the coolies, who sell hot water in the rural districts. These itinerants have an ingenious way of announcing their coming by a whistling kettle. This vessel contains a compartment for fire with a funnel going through the top. A coin with a hole is placed so that, when the water is boiling, a regular steam whistle is heard. Plentiful as tea is in China, however, the poor people there do not consume as good a quality of the leaf as the same class in our own country. Especially is this the case in the northern part of China, where most of the inhabitants just live, and that is all. 
there they are obliged to use the last pickings of tea commonly known as brick tea which is very poor and coarse in quality it is pressed into bricks about eight by twelve inches in size and whenever a quantity of it is needed a piece is knocked off and pulverized in a kettle of boiling water other ingredients consisting of soot milk butter a little pepper and vinegar are added and this combination constitutes the entire meal of the family tea in china and japan is the standby of every meal the never-failing and ever-ready refreshment besides being the courteous offering to the visitor it serves a high purpose in the home life of these peoples uniting the family and friends in their domestic life and pleasures at all times and seasons at home round the brazier and the lamp in winter evenings at picnic parties and excursions to the shady glen during the fine season tea is the social connecting medium the intellectual stimulant and the universal drink of these far and away peoples end of chapter ten Chapter 11 of The Little Tea Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Little Tea Book by Arthur Gray. Chapter 11 tea drinking in other lands while tea drinking outside of japan and china is not attended with any high days and holidays still there are countries where it is just as an important element of the daily life of its people as it is in the land of the rising sun among the burmese a newly married couple to ensure a happy life exchange a mixture of tea leaves steeped in oil in balkara every man carries a small bag of tea about with him when he is thirsty he hands a certain quantity over to the booth keeper who makes the beverage for him the bokhariot who is a confirmed tea slave finds it just as hard to pass a tea booth without indulging in the herb as our own inebriates do to go by a corner cafe his breakfast beverage is shichai tea in which bread is soaked and flavored with milk cream or mutton fat during the daytime he drinks green tea with cakes of flour and mutton suet it is considered a gross breach of manners to cool the hot tea by blowing the breath this is overcome by supporting the right elbow in the left hand and giving an easy graceful circular movement to the cup the time it takes for each kind of tea to draw is calculated to a second when the can is emptied it is passed around among the company for each tea drinker to take up as many leaves as can be held between the thumb and finger the leaves being considered a special dainty an english traveller once journeying through asiatic russia was obliged to claim the hospitality of a family of Baratsky Arabs. At mealtime, the mistress of the tent placed a large kettle on the fire, wiped it carefully with a horse's tail, filled it with water, threw in some coarse tea and a little salt. When this was nearly boiled, she stirred the mixture with a brass ladle until the liquor became very brown, when she poured it into another vessel. Cleaning the kettle as before, the woman set it again on the fire to fry a paste of meal and fresh butter. Upon this she poured the tea and some thick cream, stirred it, and after a time the whole, was taken off the fire and set aside to cool. Half-pint mugs were handed around, and the tea ladled into them. The result, a pasty tea forming meat and drink, satisfying both hunger and thirst. Monsieur Vambery says, The picture of a newly encamped caravan in the summer months, on the steppes of Central Asia, is a truly interesting one. 
while the camels in the distance but still in sight graze greedily or crush the juicy thistles the travellers even to the poorest among them sit with their teacups in their hands and eagerly sip the costly beverage it is nothing more than a greenish warm water innocent of sugar and often decidedly turbid still human art has discovered no food invented no nectar which is so grateful so refreshing in the desert as this unpretending drink i have still a vivid recollection of its wonderful effects as i sipped the first drops a soft fire filled my veins a fire which enlivened without intoxicating the later draughts affected both heart and head the eye became peculiarly bright and began to glow in such moments i felt an indescribable rapture and sense of comfort my companions sunk in sleep i could keep myself awake and dream with open eyes tea is the national drink of russia and as indispensable an ingredient of the table there as bread or meat it is taken at all hours of the day and night and in all the griefs of the russian he flies to tea and vodka for mental refuge and consolation tea is drunk out of tumblers in russia in the homes of the wealthy these tumblers are held in silver holders like the sockets that hold our soda water glasses these holders are decorated of course with the russian idea of art in every russian town tea houses flourish in these public resorts a large glass of tea with plenty of sugar in it is served at what could cost in our money about two cents tea with lemon is so general that milk with the drink over there is considered a fad the russians seem to like beverages that bite set the teeth on edge as it were the poor in russia take a lump of sugar in their mouths and let the tea trickle through it travelling tea peddlers equipped with kettles wrapped up in towels to preserve the heat and a row of glasses in leather pockets furnish a glass of hot tea at any hour of the day or night the russian samovar from the greek to boil itself is a graceful dome-topped brass urn with a cylinder two or three inches in diameter passing through it from top to bottom the cylinder is filled with live coals and keeps the water boiling hot the russian teapots are porcelain or earthen hot water to heat the pot is first put in and then poured out dry tea is then put in boiling water poured over it after which the pot is placed on top of the samovar we all know about tea drinking in england it is not a very picturesque or interesting occasion at best to the traditional englishman's mind it means simply a quiet evening at home attended by the papers and serious conversations in which the head of the house deals out political and domestic wisdom until ten o'clock during the day tea-taking begins with breakfast and rounds up on the fashionable thoroughfares in the afternoon here one may see the britishers at their best and worst these places are called tea-shops and in them one may acquire the latest handshake the freshest tea and gossip see the newest modes and millinery meet and greet the whirl of the world an interesting study of types in contrasts and conditions of society worth the price of a whole chest of choice tea we are pretty prosaic tea drinkers in america is it because there is not enough touch and go about the drink or that we are too busy to settle down to the quiet comfort and thoughtful tea ways of our contemporaries wait until a few things are settled when our kitchen queens do not leave us in the gray of the morning and all of our daughters have obtained diplomas in the art and science of gastronomy however made or taken to get best or worst is a glorious drink as a stimulant for the tired traveller and weary worker it is unique in its restful retiring soothing and caressing qualities end of chapter eleven recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida chapter twelve of 
The Little Tea Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Little Tea Book by Arthur Gray. Chapter 12 The Tea Table though all unknown to greek and roman song the paler hyson and the dark souchong though black nor green the warbled praises share of knightly troubadour or gay trouver yet deem not thou an alien quite to numbers that friend to prattle and that foe to slumbers which can long imperial poet praised so high that cent per cent its price was raised which pope himself would sometimes condescend to place commodious at a couplet's end which the sweet bard of olne did not spurn who loved the music of the hissing urn for the dear comforts of domestic tea are sung too well to stand in need of me by cowper and the bard of rimini besides i hold it as a special grace when such a theme is old and commonplace the cheering lustre of the new stirred fire the mother's summons to the dozing sire the whispers audible that oft intrude on the forced silence of the younger brood the seniors converse seldom over new where quiet dwells and strange events are few the blooming daughters ever ready smile so full of meaning and so void of guile and all the little mighty things that cheer the closing day from quiet year to year i leave to those whom benignant fate or merit destines to the wedded state tis woman still that makes or mars the man and so it is the creature can beguile the fairest faces of the readiest smile the third who comes the hyson to inhale if not a man at least appears a male the last of the rout and dogged with public cares the politician stumbles up the stairs whose dusky soul nor beauty can illume, nor wine dispel his patriotic gloom. In restless ire from guest to guest he goes, and names us all among our country's foes. Swears tis a shame that we should drink our tea, till wrongs are righted in the nation free. That priests and poets are a venal race, who preach for patronage, and rhyme for place declares that boys and girls should not be cooing when england's hope is bankruptcy and ruin that wiser twere the coming wrath to fly and that old women should make haste to die condensed from a poem published in fraser's magazine january eighteen fifty seven and ascribed to Hartley Coleridge. End of chapter twelve. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter thirteen of the Little Tea Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dalman. The Little Tea Book by Arthur Gray. Ladies' Literature and Tea. In spite of the fact that coffee is just as important a beverage as tea, tea has been sit more in literature. Tea is certainly as much a social drink as coffee, and more of a domestic for the reason that the teacup hours are the family hours. As these are the hours when the sexes are thrown together, 
and as most of the poetry and philosophy of the tea-drinking teem with female virtues vanities and whimsicalities the inference is that without women tea would be nothing and without tea women would be stale flat and uninteresting with them it is a polite purring soft gentle kind sympathetic delicious beverage in support of this theory notice what pope gay crabbe cowper dryden and others have written on the subject the teacup times of hood and hoop and when the patch was worn wrote tennyson of the early half of the seventeenth century what a suggestive couplet full of the foibles and follies of the times a picture a la mode of the period when the fair dames made their red cheeks cute with eccentric patches ornamented with high coiffures powdered hair robed in satin petticoats and square-cut bodices they blossomed according to the old engravings into most fetching figures even the bow of the day affected feminine frills in their many-colored bell-skirted waistcoats lace ruffles patches and powdered cues dryden must have succumbed to the charms of women through tea when he wrote and thou great anna whom the three realms obey thou sometimes take counsel and sometimes tay from the great vogue which tea started grew a taste for china the more peculiar and striking the design the more valuable the tea set pope in one of his satirical compositions praises the composure of a woman who is mistress of herself though china fall even that fine old bachelor philosopher and humorist charles lamb thought the subject deserved an essay in speaking of the ornaments on the teacup he says in old china i like to see my old friends whom distance cannot diminish figuring up in the air so they appear to our optics yet on terra firma still for so we must in courtesy interpret that speck of deeper blue which the decorous artist to prevent absurdity has made to spring up beneath their sandals i love the men with women's faces and the women if possible with still more womanish expressions here is a young and courtly mandarin handing tea to a lady from a salver two miles off see how distance seems to set off respect and here the same lady or another for likeness is identity on teacups is stepping into a little ferry-boat moored on the hither side of this calm garden river with a dainty mincing foot which is in the right angle of incidence as angles go in our world that must infallibly land her in the midst of the flowery mead a furlong off on the other side of the same strange stream the spectator and the tatter were also susceptible to the female influence that tea inspired in both of these journals there are frequent allusions to tea-parties in china at these gatherings poets and dilettante literary gentlemen read their verses and essays to the ladies who criticised their merits these literary teas became so contagious that a burning desire for authorship took possession of the ladies for among those who made their debut as authors about this time were fanny burney mrs alfra ben mrs manley the countess of winchelsea and a host of others one of the readers of the spectator wrote as follows mr spectator your paper is part of my tea equipage and my servant knows my humour so well that calling for my breakfast this morning it being past my usual hour she answered the spectator was not come in but the tea kettle boiled and she expected it every minute crabbe too was a devotee of the ladies literature and tea for he wrote the gentle fair on nervous tea relies whilst gay good nature sparkles in her eyes and inoffensive scandal fluttering round too rough to tickle and too light to wound what better proof do we want therefore that a woman's influence is due to the cultivation and retention of the tea habit without tea what would become of women and without women and tea what would become of our domestic literary men and matinee idols 
they would not sit at home or in salons and write and act things there would be no homes to sit in no salons or theatres to act in and the dramatic art would receive a blow from which it could not recover in this century at least in the year seventeen hundred j roberts a london publisher issued a pamphlet of about fifty pages which was made up as follows poem upon tea in two cantos thirty-four pages dedication of the poem six pages preface to the poem two pages poem upon the poem one page introduction to the poem four pages to the author upon the poem one page postscript three pages tea table two pages the poem pice de resistance which was by one naaman tate who figures on the title page as servant to his majesty is an allegory and although good in spots is too long and too dry to reproduce here the poem upon the poem the introduction and the tea-table verses will be found interesting and entertaining End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the little tea book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano the little tea book by arthur gray chapter fourteen on our english poetry and this poem upon tea see spanish curderon in strength outdone and see the prize of wit from tasso won see corneal's skill and decency refined see rapine's art and moliere's fire outshined see dryden's lamp to our admiring view brought from the tomb to shine and blaze anew the british laurel by old chaucer worn still fresh and gay did dryden's brow adorn and that its lustre may not fade on thine wit fancy judgment taste in thee combine thy powerful genius thus from censure's frown and envy's blast in flourishing renown supports our british muse's verdant crown nor only takes a trusty laureate's care lest thou the muse's garland mightst impair but more enriched the chaplet to bequeath with eastern tea joined to the laurel wreath r b end of chapter fourteen recording by greg giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter 15 of The Little Tea Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This has been recorded by Rosalind Carlyle. The Little Tea Book by Arthur Gray. Chapter 15 To the Author on His Poem Upon Tea Let rustic satire now no more abuse In rude, unskilful strains thy tuneful muse. No more let envy lash thy true-bred steed, Nor cross thy easy, just, and prudent speed, Who dexterously doth bear or loose the rein to climb each lofty hill or scour the plain with proper weight and force thy course is run where still thy pegasus has wonders done come home with strength and thus the prize has won but now takes wing and to the skies aspires while vanquished envy the bold flight admires and baffled satyr to his den retires End of chapter fifteen.
Chapter Sixteen of the Little Tea Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carrie Lynn Hewitt. The Little Tea Book by Arthur Gray. The Introduction. Fame, sound thy trump! All ranks of mortals call to share a prize that will enrich em all. You that with sacred oracles converse, And clearly would mysterious truths rehearse, On soaring wings of contemplation rise, And fetch discoveries from above the skies, Ethereal tea your notions will resign, Till you yourselves become almost divine. You statesmen who in storms the public helm Would guide with skill and save a sinking realm, Tea, your Minerva, shall suggest such sense, Such safe and sudden turns of thought dispense, That you, like her Ulysses, may advise, And start designs that shall the world surprise. You pleaders who for conquest at the bar Contend as fierce and loud as chiefs in war, would you amaze and charm the listening court? First to this spring of eloquence resort, Then boldly launch on Tully's flowing seas, And grasp the thunder of Demosthenes. You artists of the Aesculapian tribe, Would you, like Aesculapius' self, prescribe, Cure maladies and maladies prevent? Receive this plant from your own Phoebus sent, Whence life's nice lamp in temper is maintained, When dim recruited, when too fierce restrained. You curious souls, who all our thoughts apply, The hidden works of nature to descry, Why veering winds with varied motions blow, Why seas in settled courses ebb and flow, Would you these secrets of her empire know? Treat the coy nymph with this celestial dew, Like Adriadne she'll impart the clue, Shall through her winding labyrinths convey, And causes culking in their cells display. You that to Isis bark or cam retreat, Would you prove worthy sons of either seat, And all in learning's commonwealth be great? Infuse this leaf, and your own streams shall bring More science than the famed Castalian spring. Would you, O music sons, your art complete, And all its ancient miracles repeat, Rouse reveling monarchs into martial rage, And when inflamed, with softer notes assuage, The tedious hours of absent love beguile, Charm care asleep, and make affliction smile. Carouse in tea, that will your souls inspire, Drink Phoebus' liquor, and command his lyre. Sons of Apelles, would you draw the face And shape of Venus, and with equal grace In some Elysian field the figure place? Your fancy warmed by tea with wished success Shall beauty's queen in all her charms express. With nature's rural pride your landscape fill, The shady grotto and the sunny hill, The laughing meadow and the talking rill. Sons of the muses, would you charm the plains With cheerful lays or sweet condoling strains? Or with a sonnet make the valleys ring To welcome home the goddess of the spring? Or would you in sublimer themes engage And sing of worthies who adorn the age? Or with Promethean boldness would aspire To catch a spark of the celestial fire That crowned the royal conquest And could raise Juverne's boyne above Scamander's praise? Drink! Drink inspiring tea, and boldly draw a Hercules, a Mars, or a Nassau. End of chapter 16. Recording by Carrie Lynn Hewitt. Chapter 17 of The Little Tea Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
dot org recording by greg giordano the little tea book by arthur gray chapter seventeen the tea table hail queen of plants pride of elysian bowers how shall we speak thy complicated powers thou wondrous panacea to assuage the calentures of youth's fermenting rage and animate the freezing veins of age to bacchus when our griefs repair for ease the remedy proves worse than the disease where reason we must lose to keep the round and drinking others health our own confound whilst tea our sorrows to beguile sobriety and mirth does reconcile for to this nectar we the blessing owe to grow more wise as we more cheerful grow whilst fancy does her brightest beams dispense and decent wit diverts without offence then in discourse of nature's mystic powers in noblest themes we pass the well-spent hours whilst all around the virtue's sacred band and listening graces pleased attendants stand thus our tea conversation we employ where with delight instruction we enjoy quaffing without the waste of time on wealth the sovereign drink of pleasure and of health end of chapter seventeen recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida chapter eighteen of the little tea book dr johnson's affinity earliest mention of tea and australian tea this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. this has been read by rosalind carlyle the little tea book by arthur gray chapter eighteen dr johnson's affinity dr samuel johnson drew his own portrait thus a hardened and shameless tea-drinker who for twenty years diluted his meals with the infusion of this fascinating plant whose kettle had scarcely time to cool who with tea amused the evening with tea solaced the midnight and with tea welcomed the morning earliest mention of tea according to a magazinist the first mention of tea by an englishman is to be found in a letter from mr wickham an agent of the east india company written from japan on the twenty seventh of june sixteen fifteen to mr eaton another officer of the company a resident of macao asking him to send a pot of the best chaw in mr eaton's accounts of expenditure occurs this item three silver porringers to drink chaw in australian tea in the interior of australia all the men drink tea they drink it all day long and in quantities and at a strength that would seem to be poisonous on sunday morning the tea-maker starts with a clean pot and a clean record the pot is hung over the fire with a sufficiency of water in it for the day's brew and when this is boiled he pours into it enough of the fragrant herb to produce a deep coffee-coloured liquid on monday without removing yesterday's tea-leaves he repeats the process on tuesday da capo and on wednesday da capo and so on throughout the week towards the close of it the great pot is filled with an acrid mash of tea leaves out of which the liquor is squeezed by the pressure of a tin cup by this time the tea is of the colour of rusty iron incredibly bitter and disagreeable to the uneducated palate the native calls it rail good old post and riles 
the simile being obviously drawn from a stiff and dangerous jump, and regards it as having been brought to perfection. End of chapter 18「there is a fallacy among certain tea fanciers that the origin of five o'clock tea was due to hygienic demand. These students of the stomach contend that as a tonic and gentle stimulant, when not taken with meat, it is not to be equaled. With meat, or any but light food, it is considered harmful. Taken between luncheon and dinner, it drives away fatigue and acts as a tonic. This is good if true, but it is only a theory after all. Our theory is that five o'clock tea in the afternoon is the ladies' leisure hour, and that the taking of tea at this time is an escape from ennui. Tea in Ladies' Novels What would women novelists do without tea in their books? The novelists of the rougher sex write of Over the Coffee and Cigars, or Around the Gay and Festive Board, or Over the Bottle of Old Port, or another bottle of dry and sparkling champagne was cracked, or, and the succulent Welsh rarebit was washed down with the royal mugs of musty ale, or, as the storm grew fiercer, the captain ordered all hands to splice the main brace, that is, to take the drink of rum, or, as he gulped down the last drink of fiery whiskey, he reeled through the tavern doors, and his swaying form drifted into the bleak black night as a roar of laughter drowned his repentant sobs. But the ladies of the novel confined themselves almost exclusively to tea, rarely allowing their heroes and heroines to indulge in even coffee, though they sometimes treat their heroes to wine. But their heroines rarely get anything from them but oolong. End of chapter 19 Chapter Twenty of the Little Tea Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carrie Lynn Hewitt. The Little Tea Book by Arthur Gray. Sydney Smith. One evening, when Sydney Smith was drinking tea with Mrs. Austin, the servant entered the crowded room with a boiling tea kettle in his hand. It seemed doubtful, nay, impossible, he should make his way among the numerous gossips. But, on the first approach of the steaming kettle, the crowd receded on all sides, Mr. Smith among the rest, though carefully watching the progress of the lad to the table. "'I declare,' said he, addressing Mrs. Austin, "'a man who wishes to make his way in life could do no better than to go through the world with a boiling tea-kettle in his hand.'" Life of Reverend Sidney Smith Dr. Johnson again. The good doctor evidently lived up to his reputation as a tea-drinker at all times and places. Cumberland, the dramatist, in his memoirs, gives a story illustrative of the doctor's tea-drinking powers. I remember when Sir Joshua Reynolds, at my home, reminded Dr. Johnson that he had drunk eleven cups of tea. Sir, he replied, I did not count your glasses of wine. Why should you number my cups of tea? At another time a certain Lady MacLeod, after pouring out sixteen cups for him, ventured mildly to ask whether a basin would not save him trouble and be more convenient. "'I wonder, madam,' he replied roughly, "'why all ladies ask such questions.' "'It is to save yourself trouble, not me,' was the tactful answer of his hostess. End of chapter 20 Recording by Carrie Lynn Hewitt Chapter Twenty One of the Little Tea Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Carrie Lynn Hewitt. The Little Tea Book by Arthur Gray. A Cup of Tea. From St. Nicholas, December 1899. Now Gretia from her window sees the leafless poplars lean against a windy sunset sky with streaks of golden green. The still canal is touched with light from that wild wintry sky, and dark and gaunt the windmill flings its bony arms on high. It's growing late, it's growing cold, I'm all alone, says she. I'll push the little kettle on to make a cup of tea. Mild radiance from the porcelain stove reflects on shining tiles. The kettle beams so red and bright that Gretje thinks it smiles. The kettle sings so soft and low it seems as in a dream. A song that's like a lullaby, the pleasant song of steam. The summer's gone, the storks are flown, I'm always here, you see, to sing and sing and shine and shine and make a cup of tea. The blue delft plates and dishes gleam, all ranged upon the shelf. The tall Dutch clock tick ticks away, just talking to itself. The brindled pussy cuddles down and basks and blinks and purrs. And rosy, sleepy Gretje droops that snow-white cap of hers. I do like winter after all. I'm very glad, says she. I put my little kettle on to make a cup of tea. Helen Gray Cone End of chapter 21 Recording by Carrie Lynn Hewitt End of the Little Tea Book by Arthur Gray.